Maribyrnong Park has a blockbuster game against Airport West today. They've had a big week at it, Marby, and the president of the club, Stuart Donnelly, joins us on the line. Stuart, thanks for joining us on EDFL Preview. Good afternoon, Tyler. A, a big week for Maribyrnong Park. Before we talk about what's going on today with the match against Airport West, yesterday was the club's business luncheon, and I understand some very high-profile guests were there. Tell us who, and tell us how it went. We had a, a, a sport, business, and community luncheon at the football club. This time we had uh, Bill Shorten, the uh, honourable member of Maribyrnong, who's our number one ticket holder, along with uh, Peter Gordon, who was hosted by Phil Cleary, um, and we also had Lance Pacioni, who's played with us and uh, he has a charity Love Me, Love You and he spoke about um, you know some of his fights he's had against depression and, uh, and and shared some great stories of what he's doing out in the community helping people so it's a fantastic day and uh you know, sets a platform for things going forward. Now, uh, we know that uh, often when, when politicians get to, to Canberra, they, they love to adopt a, an AFL team. I think Paul Keating was a Collingwood supporter, but Bill Shorten, obviously the real deal, coming from Victoria. Uh, what's his passion for Marby like, and what does it mean to the club to have him a potential, uh, depending on how he goes, Prime Minister one day, uh, as the uh, number one ticket holder of the club? Oh, no, look, he's very passionate. He, look, he only lives up the road, so he's... he's uh should we say, you know, a, a true local in every sense of the word, and, um, you know, he, he hasn't got any of his kids playing football, but they're involved in local sport, and, um, you know, he's been down already uh, one Sunday with their juniors this year, so taking a real active involvement in, in what we're doing, and, and not only on the ground, but off the ground with some of the things we're trying to do with our with our children and um, jobs in the community and, and working together, so uh, he's very passionate and uh, spoke very well along with Peter Gordon and, Peter's, you know, as we know, he's involved with the Western Bulldogs, but uh, he's got a very strong passion for local uh, and community football, which was terrific. Stuart Adam Papel here. Um, just on, just back onto uh, back onto the football. Um, played ten games, obviously not where the club would like to be at, and, and where they hope to be at at, at, at this part of the season. Um, for for the remaining eight games, what what's the key focus for Maribyrnong Park? Oh, look, Adam, certainly to be competitive, and I think, uh, you know, we have been competitive. We just, you know, with our recruitment, we, we, you know, a lot of had good players we didn't have for the first six or eight rounds. You know, Simon Cave, um, we had Cameron Lee out for about eight weeks, so they're just coming back the last few weeks. But, look, the focus for the rest of the season is really to remain competitive and certainly win a few more games to, to keep us out of that relegation zone because we... We, we think, uh, you know, we've got a strong future, I think, against Greenvale. Uh, two weeks ago, we played uh, nine players, 20 or under, and, and, you know, they're all local kids. So, uh, no, just to remain competitive, we've got a few players back. Uh, Gareth Daly's come back to the club. Um, he's played a lot of football, and I'm just trying to you know, help our young team uh, win a few more games. And how many games for the rest, rest of the year do Ben Perry and Miles Dorman play for Maribyrnong Park? Uh, ben Perry at this stage will play the rest of the season. Um and, and Miles Dorman, you know, with his AFL commitments, I think he's available for one or two games. So um, uh, we've got young Will Couch playing today, his second game with the club. Um, so, no, no, look, we're, we're getting players back, which is important, and, and getting that depth back that we desperately need. Stu, Adam, sorry, Cogley here, mate. Uh, obviously, yeah, it's a bit of a precarious situation at, at the uh, senior level at the moment for your particular club. Obviously, uh, that threat of relegation is right there, so... Big second half of the year coming up. But on a positive note, uh, Maribyrnong Park is renowned for some of the talent that can come through. There's obviously a lot of VFL-listed players. I watched Daniel Shebeki last week for, for Richmond in the VFL. I thought he was quite good. So on a positive note at least, it must be good to see that uh, the Marby flag is being flown at higher levels and uh, some a lot of players are certainly playing some good fit. Even John Anthony right now at uh, Northern Blues after spending a year at Marby. Uh, that must be at least a positive sign for your club. Oh, absolutely, and, and particularly Daniel, he's second in the club, and he's a, he's a terrific fellow. He's had a pre-season that did a Richmond, just a level of um, you know commitment he's brought not only to himself but to the club. And, and look, he's only 22, and he's a you know very disciplined at what he does. And he's, I'm really I'm really happy for him, and we'd really love to be having him out, but out on the ground today. But uh, you know that's what we try to do. If guys can aspire to get to another level, I think it's the club's duty to help them get there. And uh, yeah, he's very involved with the club. He's fantastic on the social side, and he's a tremendous leader around the place. So, you know, and, uh, you know, we've got Duke Miller, captain of the Vic Metro side. Uh, Rory Atkins is playing some really good football in the Adelaide um, 
a sandful side at the moment, knocking on the door of senior selection. So uh, there's a lot of positives, and we've got some really great kids coming through, and I think that's typified this year with the amount of um, under-18s. I think we had five under-18s playing in the side last week. Well, uh, it's a good segue because I was going to say perhaps the greatest legacy, Stuart, of the club's two senior flags is that it's really had a good flow and effect to the juniors. And you mentioned Tuke Miller captaining Vic Metro. Uh, I was going to ask, though, uh, Rory Atkins, uh, is the club barracking for the Crows to, to drop a few more and, and fall out of the final eight mix and that might speed up Rory Atkins' uh, advance towards an AFL debut? Because it, it almost feels like he's a little bit out of sight, out of mind. This was a guy who was flying the flag in the TAC Cup for a couple of years, obviously got drafted which was great, and, and being off in the sandful, he's kind of uh, slipped out of view of uh, the EDFL community. So wouldn't it be nice if he could get his Crows debut sooner rather than later? I think we'd all love that. Um, you know, I'd coach Rory when he was a you know, seven-year-old, so I've seen his development. Look, he's had to, you know, uh, step up a lot with his training. I think the first year he found it, you know, pretty tough. As You know, some can slip straight in and some, you know, find it a bit difficult, and he certainly did, but... Um, you know, he's speaking to, I've actually spoken to someone recently over there and he's just, he's really committed himself and, and all he can do is continue to play well. I think he's you know, getting 20 plus possessions a week. I think it was the highest, took the most marks last week in their game and, um, you know, he's just got to keep pushing and, and obviously if they don't make the eight then it's probably a club decision to look at a lot of those younger players and see where they're going to take the next step. And uh, one other thing I wanted to ask about, I was sitting in the EDFL office uh, one afternoon and I got a call uh, from country South Australia from the Kapunda Football Club, not, not the sort of call you expect to take uh, any time uh, on a regular basis, and, and they were asking about Daniel Johncock and I see he's been cleared. And after we saw him on Match of the Day, uh, the big win against Duda Stars earlier in the season where he was, was excellent and we highlighted a number of the good things he did on EDFL preview, oh, sorry, EDFL uh, match review that week. I, I just wanted to know, uh, is it a job? Is it a footy decision? Uh, how come Daniel John Cock has left the club? I know it was purely a, a job opportunity. He's also got a girlfriend living in South Australia, and uh, look, he just came to the conclusion that uh, for, I suppose for his relationship and also a, a job opportunity. He had a few jobs here, and a few of those sort of uh, finished up, and um, you know, coming from Tasmania and living in Melbourne isn't as, as cheap and uh, he, he came to a decision that excuse me, that's, that's what he wanted to do so um, you know, we didn't really want to lose him given um, you know, he was playing some really good football for us and added to our depth but ultimately if it's if it's uh, decisions about employment and and family and friends sometimes that uh, that happens along the way so um, you know, we, we're probably a bit disappointed that he left at the time of year given that you know, we're not far off finishing um you know, clearances and trying to get players to replace players at this time is very difficult, but that's just one of those things that uh, happens sometimes. Uh, j- just on another note, Stuart, um, the, the name Paul Medhurst, um, we also realise, uh, understand that there's been a clearance from, from WA to, to Maribyrnong Park with Paul Medhurst. What can you tell us about that? Uh, no, well, I don't know much about it at the moment, so a few people have asked me that, but, but I haven't seen it. A clearance come through. I think, look, I think Brodie might have had a chat with him about where he was at, but um, to be honest with you, I, I can't really shed much light on that. I, um, it's probably past one discussion across my desk, and that's probably about it. So um, we, we know clearance is shutting this week, but I, I, I understand he's returning to Melbourne, so that's probably all I can really say about that at the moment. And uh, obviously, obviously, eight games to go um, for Maribyrnong Park. I guess finals is out of the question, and it's all about main, you know staying up in, in in Premier Division and building for next year. Um, as president, I'm sure you've, you've you've already got an eye on next year. Is there is there any decisions being made or anything happening regarding you know whether Brady will be coaching next year or, or whether an, an, another coach will be on board for the club? Uh, look, we're, we're sort of in those discussions at the moment. So I'd say in the next you know. Two to four weeks, we'll, we'll make an announcement on that. Um, it's uh, you know, Brody's got a you know three young children now, and uh, you know he's got a business, and his wife's working as well. So you know, his his time is only coming limited. But um, you know, it's really up to him to make a decision first before we go to the next step. But uh, we'd dearly love to have him, whether he's coaching or staying along some capacity. He's uh, got normal uh, enormous respect for what he's done and. He's actually just getting better and better as a coach all the time, and some of the you know development of our young players this year, they they really listen and take every um, 
you know, everything he says, you know, um, you know, fondly and, and understanding what he's trying to teach them and impart on them. And uh, look, we're hoping to have Brody back playing in a week or two with his foot. Um, we, you know, he, he was absolutely on fire, and you know, up to halfway through the year before he had his foot injury. And well, uh, you've uh, again segued perfectly. I was going to say the last thing I wanted to ask before we let you go this afternoon, Stuart, is uh, Brody's recovery from injury. It, it looked really quite serious to begin with, and then I heard the, the rumblings that he would get back before the end of the season. So we can expect Brody Holland back soon. It's a it, that's pretty good news. Uh, it must be a relief to a lot of people at the club, uh, given his excellent form these last two years. Yeah, he was running around the other night, and um, I think he'll ramp his training up a bit more. He seems to be. You know, not even really hobbling. Um, you know, I think uh, two weeks ago he had a moon boot on. So, um, as we know how he played his, he plays his football, he's, he's pretty tough and resilient. And, uh, you know, he's really keen to get back and, and help us out in, the, you know, probably the last six or seven games. So, look, he might even be, a, if he's not a chance next week, I would say the week after he'll be... He'll be uh, Right in there to play. Oh, th- thank you for bringing us up to speed on all matters, Marby Stewart. Congratulations on the business lunch in, uh, yesterday and uh, also all the best for the match against Airport West this afternoon. We appreciate you joining us on EDFL Preview. I no, appreciate it, Tony. Anytime. Thank you. The Hillside coach on the line, Steve Collinyuk. Steve, thank you for joining us on EDFL Preview. How are you enjoying uh, the weekend off? Are you heading out to matches today or are you just going to take the opportunity to get away from footy? No, look, I'll look at the first half of Taylor's Lakes and Glenroy, then I'll have a look at the second half of West Meadows and Craigie Burn. Steve, Adam, I'll be quite busy. Steve, Steve, Adam Papel. Adam, how you going, mate? Good, mate. How are you? Um, Steve, uh, magnificent start to the season, you know. Um, I think after five or six rounds, we'll, we'll hear applauding the way Hillside were, were going about it, uh, particularly given that, you know, he did lose some, some key names over the, uh, over the pre-season. Um, since then, the last four or five weeks has been a, has been more challenging for the club. Um, just walk us through, you know, what's what's turned around and and and, and why are those challenges. What's changed at uh, Hillside in the last four or five weeks? Look, it's hard to put a finger on. I mean, at the start of the season, we obviously, you know, we got off to a good start. Um, it could be a combination of where the clubs, you know, worked us out or took us a little bit lightly. So, you know, the last month's been difficult. Um, it is a tough competition, and, and every week you've got to come up to play, and if you don't, you know, you, you're bound for a loss. So that's, that's the biggest thing with our guys. I'm not quite sure whether some of the guys fully understand how tough this competition is. So, you know, it, it is a tough time. We, we spoke to Jared Catania on this show about six weeks ago when he was at injured, and, and the team uh, that day was, uh, you know, flying and, and winning games. and. Uh, as far as the, the morale around the group, has that stayed high or is the team now really starting to look over its shoulder at the bottom of the table and, and really the, the thoughts are turning to avoiding relegation? Look, okay, our goal from day one was to, to avoid, uh, well, obviously it was to stay and survive in this division and that, that's still our goal. So, you know, we didn't look too far ahead. We were lucky with a couple of wins early in the season. Um, like I said, it is a very, very even comp. So, you know, we, we've lost a little bit of confidence over the last couple of weeks. And, um, you know, I don't want to blame, you know, too many things, but uh, for those that were there and, and saw uh, some uh, decisions that were made against us over the last couple of weeks, I mean, you know, it's easier to, for the players to lose confidence when things like that happen. Steve Adams, Harry Cogley here, mate. Uh, two two things I'm really keen to get your thoughts on. How, how can Hillside turn it around in the second half of the year? Because you're in that situation where... Uh, relegation is uh, obviously a possibility, but at the same time, uh, you're not out of the finals hunt either. So how can you turn things around when the season does resume? And uh, secondly as well, I want to get your thoughts on just uh, how different Division 1 footy is from Division 2 and uh, how you guys have handled the jump. Look, I mean, we, we probably lost 8 to 10 premiership players from last season. So, you know, we sort of ended up getting through for new recruits. Uh, we're playing the young kids. You know, the young kids sometimes up against the bigger bodies, you know, you know, look, it's very tough for those young kids to sort of to pick up the ball. It's broken every week now. It's sort of getting on the bigger ground. Right? On the, the smaller, tighter grounds, we're being found out with uh, just physical strength. So it's going to take a fair bit for us to turn it around. But like you said, it's, you know, two weeks, I guess, is a long time in footy. So... I feel like I said, having the buy of the weekend off um, gives them a little bit of a, an injection. Oh, well, the, uh, the line may have just dropped out. But, uh, a little bit. So the, oh, the task certainly doesn't get any easier. 
Sorry about that, uh, Steve. The line dipped out for just a second there, but we do have you back. Um, another thing that uh, we, we really want to ask about is the junior ranks and the, the talent production coming through at Hillside. I suppose one thing that makes the senior job there so enticing is that you know that there's going to be good kids coming out of the under-18s, but the Western Jets think the same thing, and they've actually uh, taken away some of your match winners uh, on occasions this year. It's obviously a credit to the club, but uh, how's the balancing act uh, when you when you hear about the, uh, the TAC Cup selections during the week, knowing that those kids uh, won't be there for you every single game? Oh, look, we love them playing the Jets, but like I said, we love them also playing at Hillside. So we've had five kids play at the Western Jets this year. Um, that'll be, look, I'd still class Nicholas Jewett. So as a Hillside kid, he's only ever played footy at Hillside, but he's since got a clearance to Deer Park. He'll play. So, you know, have six players. You know, and also there's another kid that's playing seniors with me at the moment who'll probably get a game as well. So, effectively, this season we may have had seven hillside you know, juniors play at the Western Jets. So, yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, again, the uh, the line is just dipping out there. Look elsewhere to try to further their footy careers with their juniors. All right, uh, Steve, we, we might just ask you one more because uh, the phone line is giving us a few headaches at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, just lastly, um, preparation uh, through the bye weekend, what were your instructions to the players and what do you expect when you see them back at training on Tuesday? Just to prepare themselves for a, for a tough month and, you know, just mentally it, it's a challenge and there's only seven weeks of footy left, so just give it your all, basically. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Steve colin there, the Hillside coach, joining us on the line. Enjoy the weekend off and uh, look forward to catching up with you again later in the season. Thanks, boys. Uh, the Women's AFL Exhibition Game is being held tomorrow at Etihad Stadium. It's now become an annual clash between Melbourne Football Club and the Western Bulldogs. Uh, of course, uh, women's football, we have the youth girls in EDFL ranks, but our, our next guest actually came through the ranks playing against the boys. It's Madeline Kerrick. Uh, she's been recruited to play for the Western Bulldogs team tomorrow. She actually played for Melbourne in the corresponding game last year, and she joins us on the line now. Madeline, thanks for speaking to us on EDFL Preview. Great to talk to you. Uh, Madeline, uh, of course, your connections to the EDFL are quite strong. Three older brothers, all of whom played at Aberfeldy, and, and you did yourself. But uh, women's football is really starting to take off in Victoria, and uh, it's great to see once again that uh, you'll be a part of the uh, the women's AFL exhibition game. How exciting is it to know that you'll be back out there on Etihad Stadium tomorrow? Um, yeah, I'm very excited to be a part of it all. It should be a really great experience. Um, I was fortunate enough to play for Melbourne last year as well, and it was such a great experience running out on the MCG, so I'm really excited to get to the game at Eddie Head tomorrow, and um, we'll have a really, really good team down um, for the Western Bulldogs girls, and I'm confident we can get a win tomorrow, so it should be good. Matty Adam, sorry, Cogley here, mate. Uh, uh, congratulations on, on getting there uh, last year, and obviously... Uh, getting another gig this year as well. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but so you're one of the younger girls out there, aren't you? You're sort of just around the 18 mark, is that right? Um, yeah, I've just turned 19, and yep. um, it's the open-age women's uh, AFL game, so there's a couple other girls that are my age, but the majority, average age, would probably be about 25, so yep. I'm pretty lucky to be getting a run around so young. Yeah, how, how did you handle that last year, being one of the younger girls out there, and uh, some of these girls are obviously the, well, the best uh, footballers in the country, and uh, yeah, it's obviously uh, the highest standard game that you can get in women's footy. How did you handle it last year, and uh, what kind of experience can you take out of that into tomorrow's game? Um, it was a really good experience for me, um, being younger, it's um, it was good to be around the older girls and to see how they prepare for the game. I was able to learn a lot and see how they go about it, so I could. Um, I was able to learn a lot from them. And this year as well, it's just really good just getting that experience and being exposed to those players and seeing how they train, how they play. It's a, um, it's a really great opportunity to learn a lot and improve my own footy, so I'm really excited. The, uh, yeah. The EDFL had a youth girls interleague team uh, that, of course, played in the last month, and, and there's also a youth girls division, and more and more clubs are, are bringing the teams on board. But how important are days like today to uh, get out there and be role models to young players? Because I suppose if that's the one thing women's footy uh, would love, they'd love to have their own version of a Liz Ellis or a, a different a, a Lane Beachley, for instance, a, a role model that they can look up to. So how important is this one game a year to show other young girls out there who are considering playing footy that uh, it is it is something that they can aspire to do? Oh, it's huge. Um, it, 
but before this game, you know, there was just nothing. It's me growing up, it's always playing AFL is something I never thought I'd be able to do because it, was, it just wasn't done. No girls ever played. And so having um, this match, even though it's not a full-on competition, hopefully it will be in the future um, at the moment, um, it, but it gives girls something to look up for, up to and something to aspire to and then in the future it'll be um, a bigger and better competition that they can aspire to be a part of. So Madeline, yeah, it, it just gives them something real, makes it tangible for them. Madeline, about yourself, what position will you be playing and, 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 and what type of player are you? I, I'm a midfielder, so I'll be running through the midfield. Um, tomorrow. I'm a, more of an inside mid, midfielder in an under type player. I want to talk about one player in particular, Corey McCauley. I think there was a tackle here in the second quarter, laid a big tackle, got the, uh, the player holding the ball. Um, he also made a big smother in the third quarter there when uh, Alex Ross from the opposing team kicked it in, then he kicked a goal from that effort, and then he took a big mark uh, down the other end. Uh, he didn't really have too much of an impact uh, in general play, or, or he didn't have as much of an impact as some of the other players, but those three moments, they, they, they were real crucial stages in the game, and it seems like a high-impact player. Yeah, well, Corey's been struggling for a little bit of form. He's been in the twos the last couple of weeks, and he's been playing well there. We've just taken that next step up into the senior side. Um, but these young kids know now that they have to, if they get the opportunity, everything they have to do is, you know, probably has to be the best thing for the side. And them three things will probably hold his spot on, you know, mm. from where he was last week. So he's, he's, that's all I need. If these kids go out there and give me little things like that, well, you know, they'll keep their spot. So, we, we caught up pre-game and, and spoke about how you beat East Keelor last week and it was really a, a, a repeat effort today. Uh, the first quarter, nine goals, and it just felt like you could score with ease and, and score freely. Uh, for East Keelor, it was four quarters of it, really. Today, uh, it was the one, and it, by the end of the day, your first quarter almost beat Keelor Park's total score for the afternoon. It only would have lost to them by a couple of points. So how important was that, that good start, and what does this say... Uh, that the rest of the league is sort of on notice, that once Jakarta gets going, you guys can uh, score multiple goals in quick succession. Yeah, that, we tried to work on that uh, in the last two years because we were so far back and, you know, we had these 200, 300 point floggings, you know, two years ago. It was, it's hard to get the local boys back up to where we need to be with believing in yourselves and, mm. and getting to the front. But now they've got that belief and we, we lack them starts. We're getting these starts now, which we're getting to the front and the opposition side has to play catch-up instead of us playing catch-up football, which is a credit to our boys. We're starting well, that's what we've worked on, and that's what's got us over the line the last three weeks. Uh, I was just going to say, how far do you, does this group believe it can go this year? You've knocked off East Keelor. Today was probably the biggest game of the year in terms of, I suppose, the context of the season, and you got the job done there. You guys are getting it done at the moment. You're in the four at the moment. You're a game clear in the four. What, what is the belief like in this group at the moment as for just exactly what damage you guys can cause later in the season? At this stage, any belief is good belief for me and they're believing at the moment. So, you know, who knows? We're going to take one step at a time each game, you know, each week as it comes. And, you know, if we keep playing football like this, you know, we, we knocked off the East Keeler last week and, you know, they'd lost one game. Who knows? You know, they can do anything. They're a good bunch of young kids. They're starting to listen and learn. And, look, we've got the talent there, you know, Obviously, like any club, you've got your injuries, but you know they're working hard, and uh, I can't fault them at any stage of the last the commitment the last three weeks. It's been really good. Matt, you mentioned the kids a lot, but who, who are the, the real leaders that have, uh, I guess, incited this change and, and, this, uh, and driven this cultural shift for you guys and, and, and driven that belief that you spoke about? Who are the, the real leaders amongst the group? Mate, probably Brian Bell. He'd have to be our ruckman, mate. If he's not close to one of the best ruckmans in our division, you know, every week he just dominates and puts his body on the line. Then you've got another couple of uh, midfielders, Shane Cleary and Ash Clooney. Um, you know, we've got young boys who came out seven West last week, and Mick Evans at present every week down forward for us. Um, Brad Hollow across ha half back, he's another standout. Um, you know, they probably stand up every week for us. Daniel Sacco, our captain. You know, he started coming in the form where he started a bit slow. 98.9 you know, so Northwest. We're getting there and it's um, really good that, you know, a couple of these blokes were injured today and come off and the young kids uh, took the next up, which is good. And Ash, oh, oh. Just, oh, just on the, yeah, the injury front, Ash Clooney, what, what, what's the, the uh, diagnosis there, do we know? It's just a rolled ankle at this stage. Um, he just eye set and we'll reassess him, you know, come Monday and Tuesday and, and see how he goes. He might see the physio and whatever, but, um, yeah, that's where we're at with his ankle at the moment. But, yeah. Our injury list um, isn't too bad at the moment. You know, you've always got a couple of fringe blokes, but we've got a couple to come back in. So, 
yeah, it's all, all positive and looking good. You guys came out for the warm down after the game. Danny Sacco, is he your brother? Is that the Cousin. relation? Cousin. Yep. What's wrong with him? Because he came out shirtless and it is about five degrees today. We spoke to him after the game, immediately after the game, and you, know, you spoke quite well, obviously, uh, pumped for the win, but uh, yeah. You, you asked Daniel, <laughs> and he told me he could get his shirt off. He's got real. a few ladies around. Yeah, he's, a, he's a ladies' man, and you know, any time he can get that shirt off, it comes off. So, yeah, I don't know what goes through his, through his head, mate. It's four <laughs> degrees outside. Uh, just uh, one to finish with the around-the-ground scores for Division 2. Kobeck District's a comfortable winner against Burnside Heights. That one's still going. Uh, we also have East Keelor 17-11-113, defeating East Sunbury 8-6-54. And Roxborough Park 9-6-60, coming from behind to beat Mooney Valley 6-8-44. So Roxborough Park's done you a big favour because Mooney Valley was in front at three-quarter time. It means he got that little bit more of a hold on fourth spot for now. But uh, just your final thoughts on uh, maybe who some of your best were today because we've still got to vote and work out who we're giving the Player of the Day award to. So um, I, I think from a coaching perspective that just give me everything all day. Matthew Solano was pretty good. Um, mm. Good small crumbing forward plays anyway. Can play him back on ball. Um, Ash Clooney didn't give up all day. Another on baller. Um, probably out of them two, I'd, I'd toss up between them. But across the board, I I like it when it's hard for me to do my own votes um, because if you've got a consistent side that's playing good footy. I'm a happy man. We have a guest uh, with us, Andrew Bubba, the assistant coach of Keelor Park, has joined us in the box. Andrew, uh, not the circumstances under which we would like to be talking and a, a frustrating day at the office for your team. Uh, how has it left uh, yourself and also Rob McCluskey, the coach, feeling? Uh, we're pretty flat at the moment. Um, first quarter said it all. They kicked nine goals to three and that set it up for the whole game for them. We had more scoring shots than for the whole game, but just in that last quarter, played into their hands, playing in the bottom corner here and in the breeze, so. We thought it was going to be a high-scoring shootout all day and both teams would get a use of the win. So how come it, it, it closed down so much? Would you put it down to something Jakana did or was it more uh, execution yeah. from, from your boys? Every time uh, we, we were kicking with the breeze, Jakana played this side of the club room, side of the ground, and played really well. We, we kept going along this side of the boundary line instead of trying to square the ball up into the centre of the ground using the centre corridor. So we played straight into their hands, which that's what they wanted, just chipping it around, coming near the back line and on the club room side. Andrew, on a positive note, you guys did, uh, I guess, kick more goals into the wind, and usually the team that kicks more goals into the wind is the team that wins the game. Are you guys just putting this loss down to the first quarter solely? Because after half time, oh, after quarter time, as you said, you were, you were a lot more competitive, and you even kicked uh, one goal, I think one goal 11 or one goal 9 in, in the, the last quarter, sorry, to, to you know, the 10 scoring shots in that last quarter to just two and restricted them to just two goals uh Two goals, one in in uh, their efforts uh, into the breeze. Yeah, the, it, it's hard because, uh, like I was saying, they played it really well by when they played into the breeze. They just kept chipping it around, coming out this side all the time, and held it in the pocket. Whereas we never were directly going back into the centre of the ground, and we kick well. We kicked a couple three three in that first quarter, but then we should have held them a lot better than letting them kick nine goals in the first quarter, and we probably solely set them up. They're up and about then after kicking nine goals in the first quarter. On an individual basis, uh, Judd Darby, tell us a bit about him because he was one of the, I suppose, prize recruits that you guys brought yeah, across. Yeah, Judd Darby came from uh, Bonnie Doon. He's, I think he's won their best and fairest about four out of the last five years or something there and uh, has moved down to Melbourne. So he he's, uh, lives with Benny Ryan and uh, got him across the line this year. He's really good. He's a hard trainer. He's good on the track. Um He's a great asset to have at the club this year. So, yeah. And you guys were missing Luke Walsh, Andrew Porco today. Uh, what, what was the deal uh, Luke there? Walsh pulled a hamstring Thursday night training yep. and Andrew Porco's in New Zealand back, I think it's back Wednesday, I think. Two pretty key outs, aren't they? Because they've both been very good this year. Yeah, it hurt us. And then uh, Brad Williams went down in the warm-up. So that yep. was a, yep. So we'd, uh, we brought Aiden Kasser up, who played full game of the two, so... And obviously does test the depth a little bit at the that, moment. This that time that is at the moment. Yeah. So we've got a couple of injuries in the twos. We're sort of, we have got a, we need a few more blokes just to push the seniors along a little bit more. But it was good a couple of the day. Like Matt Liddy got a game today and that, which he, you know, he went all right for his first senior game for this year. So, And Andrew, I thought um, Alex Ross played a reasonably good game today. There was one aspect there when we, we saw him uh, kick the ball into the man on the mark, resulted in, in a goal the other way. How is it, have you spoken to him? How is he feeling about it? Because I thought that uh, that sort of maybe swayed the momentum slightly, but I thought he played a pretty good game overall. Yeah, he's been another uh, great pick-up for us this year. Alex Ross probably been 
best on ground I think the last couple of weeks for us uh, he play, played out in the wing but then we, we need him to go through the midfield as a rotation at times so uh, he's a bit a lot of the players are pretty flat at the moment it's really quiet in the rooms like mm. you, you would have thought we lost the grand final and Jakarta won it the way it was so. and, and with that first quarter did you put that down to more uh, a lack of uh, I, I guess leg speed in the midfield or, or the, was it the defence that you thought was uh, the, the problem or I just don't think the guys were switched on today mm. just yeah, I could see before we even ran out on the ground, they were just joking around a bit too much. They weren't switched on, ready for a big game of football against Chicana, which, you know, they had a great win last week beating East Kilo, so they've improved a lot. It's a big letdown, isn't it, considering you came into the game with some good form. You got some pretty big wins in the lead-up to this one today. It was obviously a massive game as well, and uh, it doesn't let up the draw because next week you go to East Kilo or your cross-town it. rival, so... How do you get these boys back up? And uh, I suppose it's going to be imperative this week to make sure that they're switched on and uh, have a good week on the track and then come Saturday, uh, really push uh, East Keelor, who right now are gettable with their recent form. No, nah, that's it. Yeah, it's about recovery now. Like, make sure the boys do a recovery between now and Tuesday night and then get on the track and work on a, on a few things where we're lacking in that and um, go ahead from there, so... And you, you do get your car under the way the fixture works means you play them in the last round of the season. I suppose, uh, how much will the team learn about playing them head-to-head? Because could, that could be a virtual elimination final, uh, assuming you guys can uh, still pick up the wins along the way. Uh, and assuming that Jakarta's good form will continue, there's a very good chance it might be a situation just like today where the winner gets fourth. So uh, how much do you think you will have learned about Jakarta? I've learned a lot about them. Um, I think they had a lot of heart today. They played with a lot of spirit, uh, and which was great for the Jakarta Football Club. But then, you know, a couple of blokes to come back for us. Hopefully, you know, Luke Walsh is a big loss for us today with the uh, sentiment. So, and then Andrew Porco. So, if we get those two back, it'll make a lot of difference for us. Crucial result as far as the top four goes. And their coach, Steve Burns, is on the line. Steve, thanks for joining us on EDFL Review. No problem, Tyler. Congratulations on the win. Uh, looking at Hello. the. Yep, yeah, we've got you uh, loud and clear, Steve. Uh, looking at the scores, just uh, one point in the final quarter for your boys, but it was a. A handy point in the end. Tell us about the finish and uh, what it means to have got over the line against Glenroy. Yeah, it was a massive game. We set ourselves up to obviously win this because it was going to um, create some gap between us and Glenroy uh, heading into the last six games of the year. But uh, it was a sort of one uh, one end day with probably a four or five goal breeze, and um, they played really well in the last quarter. We just we tried to uh, ice the game a little bit, and it nearly came back to bite us. Um, they uh, probably missed a set shot with uh, probably two minutes to go. Um, didn't make the distance, which kept our lead, and we sort of killed the ball for the last uh, minute and a half and came away with a uh, really gutsy, gutsy win, which uh, we love. And it was a big day for our club because Chris Reduce had played his 350th game, and um, yeah, it was just great to win, mate. Uh, Steve Adams, Harry Cogley here, mate. Congratulations. It was a really important game today, and you guys were able to get the job done. So. Congratulations on that front. Uh, you mentioned Raguso was at 350 games, was it? Uh, 350, yeah, mate, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we, we know you guys have a, a lot of uh, good experience and a lot of high-quality players in the side today. Um, yeah, who, who was good for you today? Were you able to get some guys back into the size? I know you were a little bit undermanned against West, Co- uh, West Meadows last week. Uh, sort of how, how closely are you guys tracking to, I suppose, what you would res- uh, call uh, something close to resembling a top 22 at the moment, best 22? Well, it's still, um, we're still probably two or three short of our best side, but um, that was our best side on the parts of the year, no doubt. Um, uh, you know, look, it's no excuse, every side has injuries and that, but we've had a, we've had a bad trot and um, we're slowly getting them right at, at the right time of the year, I suppose. You know, you want to have them right now, so uh, there was no excuses for us today. If we hadn't won, we'd jump in our best side for the year, so we're starting to track them the right way. Um, Moving forward, um, you know, we should get two more back next week and maybe lose one from today with an injury, but um, all, all things are looking good for us. And today, our best players were Matt Morelli sort of won the game for us in the end off his own booty. He was outstanding in the last quarter and Mark D'Souza kicked six playing down forward today. Um, and Nathan Allen, who's back after two years stint of not playing footy at 34 years of age, he... Uh, he was outstanding for us at centre forward, so it was a good day for us. But, but Mark's been playing, but Mark's been pretty sore and been playing through his injuries, and we sort of took a bit of the pressure off him today because we knew he'd get heavily tagged again. And uh, he uh, 
punt full forward and was outstanding and let him put one on the ball in the last quarter and and lifted as well for us uh, and helped get us across the line. So our two champions in the rally in the season, you know, they were, they were fantastic, as they always are. The uh, the ladder is uh, really close between yourselves and West Meadows, but you now have a two game break on Glenroy, and you're three games behind Tullamarine. So right now you find yourselves as uh, in in the middle, uh, by no means safe in the top four. But a, a match like today must make the boys feel a lot more comfortable about going on and uh, chasing Tullamarine without having to look over their shoulders. Oh, definitely, Tyler. It's, um, it's a it was a huge win because really what's key going to clear if you take in the in the buy into consideration. So, um, you know, we thought Glenroy would be a, our biggest challenge are coming from behind. Um, um, so to, to beat them and in the in the manner that we did it, because we played some really decent footy today early, um, was very pleasing. And look, I think West Coburg and Taylor Marine are, are well ahead of the pack at the moment, um, probably rightly so. I think we've probably been their main contender though out of the rest of the sides. We pushed both sides right to the wire and um, I think with our big fight on the paddock come finals time that uh, if we make it um, that we'll be able to um, you know give them a good run for the money both of those sides Steve that other club at the moment that's in contention and you uh, got a first uh, hand look at them last week West Meadows you lost to them by a goal in what was a very low scoring affair looks like both clubs uh, didn't exactly kick straight that day either um yeah, you, you, well, it's obviously quite clear that West Coburg and Tullamarine are a step or two ahead of the pack at the moment, but uh, are, are they gettable? If you guys can start getting some games uh, into, I suppose, what you would call uh, something close to your best 22, if you're able to string some games together later in the year, get some form, and I think you'll play West Meadows again, you might late in the year. Uh, certainly it looks like you might play them in finals. Uh, you know, Just how far can uh, Taylor's Lakes go this year and... Uh, yeah, sort of. Uh, how far back do you think you guys are from the from that top two at the moment? I don't think we're that far behind them at all. Um, West Coburg, we should have beaten at home. Um, they are quality; so they've got some really good players. But I think Digby Morrell sort of was the only difference between the two sides. And we had uh, one of our key defenders out that day, so he comes back in and it sort of squares things up a little bit. And they were nearly at full strength when we played them, and we had sort of five out. Um, I think we can beat them. Um, that's not trying to be arrogant and cocky about it. I just think at our best, we're, we're capable of doing it. I think Taylor are the, are the standard outside. Um, and we were five goals up against them at uh, half-time and didn't touch it in the second half. They were absolutely green in the second half. If they play like that, uh, no one will beat them. Um, but I, I think probably we drop off a little bit and they just look at their rating. And if we can compete with them like we did in the first half in the finals, well, then, yes, we can beat them. But... That's a big ask. They, uh, they to me, look like a yardstick. Um, West Meadows last week, both sides were terrible, I thought. Uh, us and them, it was probably our worst game of footy for the year. Uh, I don't think West Meadows were much better either. And, um, you know, both sides, when we do get to the finals, we'll have to play a lot better to ensure, uh, ensure a victory in that first final, that's for sure. The draw really opens up for you guys now. Uh, it's going to be really important, I suppose, that uh, you guys can consolidate now and uh, get some wins on the board. I mean, Hillside, Oak Park, Hadfield, that's your next run of games, and that's before uh, the two top clubs, West Coburg and Tullamarine. So just uh, is it really important to just... Uh, obviously, you guys don't want to become too complacent, obviously, uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks, but uh, it's really imperative that you can get some wins now and... Uh, really build on something before those big clashes against uh, Tuller and uh, West Coburg. And I do look in the record, you, do, you guys do have West Meadows again in the second last round. So it's a tough finish to the year, but right now is when you've got to make it count, I suppose. Yeah, it's, it's true. Look, but Hillside beat us the first time. Um, first time we've ever beaten us. And uh, if they have their, their full list to pick from, they're an exciting young team and, um, and they have the capabilities of, of knocking off anybody. I think they might have dropped off a little bit at the moment because they've had some injuries and the kids are all at the Jets. Um, Oak Park are a very, very good football side who have been very unlucky. Should have beaten us first time around, so definitely won't be going to Oak Park, and we never, we never would go to Oak Park complacent. And, and Hatfield are one of those teams that, oh, so I was say, that could they beat anybody on any given day. So, um, you know, we're, we're not taking any of them easily at all, and uh, we'll have to be their best to win all three games. It's just a tough, tough even competition, and Craigie Byrne are really coming to the fore in the second half of the year, and um, making it a very even competition right the way through. There's no easy games.
Well, uh, Steve, thanks so much for joining us after the game. Congratulations on a one-point win today uh, against Glenroy, and we look forward to seeing your team live at some stage later in the season. Uh, no doubt uh, Taylor's Lake's a team to be reckoned with, and uh, thank you for joining us on EDFL Review. No worries, boys. Thanks.